Hello World. I'm your host for this wrap of some of the best talks and the coolest speakers at PG Connects London, the Global Games Conference. In this episode, I catch up with two speakers during the event. We have Carl Knights, Global VP of Customer Success at Data.ai, who dropped the data proving gaming has not been hit by a slowdown, as we had thought. And we have Lee Ray Ding, Senior Associate at Transcend Fund, who shares the esports trend you need to watch. So listen, learn, and love this episode. So Carl, I have to say that it has been a tremendous year in gaming, and Data AI data is in nearly every article that I'm writing. The big one, of course, for the first time since the advent of the app stores, gaming revenues are down. They're not down a lot, but it made the headlines and yeah. we're all feeling a little bit sort of like, well, okay, a little sobering, yeah. but you have fresh new data that we're all going to download because I'm going to include it in the show notes and on the show highlights. Where are we now? There's a natural, uh, I think we are still very much looking at this period of time from the kind of false highs of the COVID 2020, 21 years. And as you say, in 2022, you know, consumer spend in games was down around kind of 6%, five and a half, six percent 6%, right? Which um, is tough news to take. What we've seen in 2024 is that kind of level out. So it's only in terms of all markets down around 2% 2023 on 2022. But in fact, if you go a level deeper, that includes data from the, the market in China, which not every business is necessarily um, able to operate in. And obviously there's restrictions of the, those that reside in China in terms of usage. So we also looked at if you removed that market, in fact, spend within games in uh, 2023 increased by 4%. Okay, so the decline in China was around 11%. So in the overall global figures, that means that it year over year is down 2%, but remove that market, it's up 4%, okay? So um, in all aspects, really, whether it's kind of leveling out in terms of downloads, um, we are seeing, you know, uh, spend bounce back. Um, you know, in, in 2023, to think of some of the games that really stood out in that, uh, obviously it was a huge year for the likes of Monopoly Go, um, you know, so that's a category that, you know, has kind of made its way into the kind of the top 10 for the first time, um, you know, continued enormous um, in-game spend for the RPG titles like Genshin Impact, Honjay Star Rail, uh, Linear Gem, Pokemon Go. Those continue to be, you know, significant, um, uh, significant games in terms of generating spend. So downloads generally leveling out, spend bouncing back a little bit. Um, we always kind of talk about time as well. You know, that's always a factor of our state of mobile report. And each year we kind of come to do this event or any others, it's like, well, hours are up to four hours and four and a half. Um, it, it's around the kind of five hour mark now. It's not increasing quite to the same level. So I think I would imagine we're getting to a point where, you know, naturally it's either even more competitive to kind of get mind share and time of, uh, of, of gamers and customers as a whole. But um, but yeah, we did see in particularly in the in the top 25 markets that time spent gaming is, is again, just kind of leveling out now. There's not enormous growth in that, even down around kind of a couple of percentage points in um, in 2023. So yeah, downloads level, time level, but we are seeing spend just starting to kind of bounce back. Um, and, a, you know, another component of that is mobile ad spend as well, which, you know, despite the challenges of the economy in 2023, you know, actually saw an 8% increase year over year. So, you know, compound annual growth rate in mobile ad spend is around 16.2%. And we're expecting that to be even bigger in, uh, in 2024. That's surprising in itself because mobile ad spend means that we are monetizing through ads. I've been hearing so much about in-app purchase, even other ways of monetizing. Um, distill that into maybe the ad formats or the forms is it still like video is massive is it is it playable is it reward what is that ad spend looking like where is it going hard to kind of extract any specific themes uh to, to to be in terms of kind of creative formats what we do feel is that this you know as you mentioned both kind of in-app you know kind of purchase being you know arguably the kind of primary way to monetize the kind of blend of the two is definitely something which we see 
more and more of. Um, so, you know, even coming from, you know, the kind of the hyper casual genre, um, which, you know, didn't have a great year in terms of downloads, but that footprint is phenomenal. And, you know, we are seeing, you know, for the first time in certain titles, you know, experimentation with in-app spend as well in combination with, you know, their, their classic way to monetize via, via ads. So that is definitely something we see emerging, the kind of the two living quite, you know, symbiotically and, and well together. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd have to dig deep on exactly what the creative formats are that are really generating the best results. Well, speaking of digging deeper, what I like about your report last time was that you were distilling the key characteristics of successful games. Now, yeah. have to admit, I only heard about your data right now, so I don't know what's in it. But have you done that as well? Have you looked for the common threads that are significant or signify a successful game? What we definitely saw in the data in 2023 was, you know, those games with very strong intellectual property, very strong IP really won out considerably. So I mentioned Monopoly Go before that had a tremendous year. Um, you know, we looked into it deeper. Definitely the kind of the social interaction capabilities to play with family and friends. Um, you know, a lot of the kind of mini games and offers within that as well seem to kind of drive in app purchase very, very well. Um, but, you know, if we look at that kind of IP across uh, the release from Netflix in the back end of 2023 of the GTA trilogy performed particularly well in just a few weeks. Um, you know, EA, um, EA Sports, FC Mobile Soccer performing particularly well. Genshin Impact continuing to, you know, drive phenomenal uh, in-app purchase. So it, it is does feel like it is those uh, those games with with, a, with with strong IP that are really performing uh, performing well. Um, probably the other one I would call out would be uh, Dream Games Royal Match as well. Um, what we see there, which is quite interesting, um, firstly. It's quite interesting to note that there's not a crossover with, you know, the the leader in that category in Candy Crush, which has been, you know, number one for, for 10 years. In fact, what they're managing to do is is find new new audience. There's very little crossover with Candy Crush. Only 10% of, of those that play Candy Crush play uh, Royal Match. And again, just looking at the kind of fairly simple um, uh, kind of gaming dynamics there, but also tying the in-app purchases to some of the characters um, seems to have worked really well for uh, for that game, which has been downloaded 219 million times, and you know, almost 2.6 billion in in-app spend. So, um, so yeah, I I would say IP and you know, simple game dynamics, driving social interaction, feel to be the the kind of the key threads which we're seeing the most successful games follow. I'm glad you mentioned Dream Games because it's a hint to you guys out there. I have approached you for a Pocket Gamer podcast, a PG.biz podcast. I will not give up. This even underlines my determination to get you guys on a show. But I will turn back to you again, Carl, because another point in the last report that stood out was sort of the winning subgenres, the ones we're not thinking of, that blending, that melding. You said yourself, the monetization models are, me are melding. Yeah and blending together. So are the genres. Everybody I know in hyper casual or hybrid casual saying, hey, we're looking at casual mm -hmm. and casual saying, hey, we're looking at puzzle. Um, where are you seeing the trends in the subgenres? We start there with kind of hyper casual, the, the standout games that we, um, you know, that we observed in 2023. Uh, so the likes of uh, Race Master, Bridge Race, um, Magic Title, um, you know, those are just some of the ones that really kind of stood out uh, in, in 2023. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, the um, the kind of the, the party genre, again, I, I'm probably kind of coming back to, um, again, Monopoly Go. But, you know, the two, the leader there is is still Coin Master from, from, from Moon Active. Um, but in terms of the category that stood out the most, both in terms of um, an increase in downloads and kind of in-app spend was the party category, right? So, you know, that's one which... Clearly, you know, don't want to keep going on about Monopoly Go, but that's clearly one that's, that's been able to, you know, monopolize on uh, monopolize on that. Sorry, so it's a shameless plug. Um, but uh, but yeah, that, 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 that's the one that we see as, as, you know, has the most kind of standout. So, you know, as a genre and subgenre, that's where that's where it's. Isn't it wild, though, when you think about it? Because there are a couple of sessions here about how to dig back into old games, yeah. rekindle them 
There's money to be made in nostalgia. And there are people who are saying, let's go back. Let's get these old games. We don't remember them from 2014 or something yeah. and, and bring them back. And here you go. That's what your point is. Is there a lesson in that for you? Sounds like easy money. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I, my, my mind's spinning as to what, what are some of the other you know, the other board games that we played that you know can can have a, a new life. You know, I, I started this this discussion with that kind of strength of intellectual property, but combining that with getting the social interaction right, and you know, simple simple in game mechanics. Um, you know, tying it to another emotive component, be that kind of the characters or you know something that enables something special between you and people you care about. Yeah, that's a very, very potent, potent cocktail, a very potent mix. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd be intrigued. Uh, I'm sure there's smarter people than me that are thinking on, you know, what are the next, uh, the next IPs that can be um, given, a, given a new life? Because it does, it does connect in a way which, you know, I, I would argue, um, you know, games that don't have that just, you know, we, we, we this isn't a number of these have been around for a number, you know, a number of years now. And, you know, perhaps there's a little bit of apathy, a little bit of, you know, people are tired of certain, um, you know, trying and testing, but, you know, look at Candy Crush has remained part of many people's everyday lives for more than 10 years. Um, and, you know, that's an illustration of how, you know, that is a true brand IP in itself, which has uh, stood the test of time. So I think there's a combination of both those that were kind of the initial innovators, if you like, and established themselves in this market and really interested to see what could come back in. Yeah, I'm sure success of Monopoly Go is going to, you know, drive a lot of new, um, a lot of new opportunities as well. So yeah, if you're the owner of, of IP, it's, um, it's a good thing. Talking about IP, your biggest IP is your data. And you have this 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 matrix, this score. Yeah. How are people applying that? Give me an idea about how it's going to be different in 2024 to understand, let alone measure performance. Yeah, good question. So yeah, um, so our mobile performance score MPS is is very much our our move to provide more of kind of predictive AI than you know uh, applied AI that we have today. So it's really, I'd say the value of that is, is really to understand the future performance of, of apps and games. And we've actually seen that pretty consistently in the data. So any game or app that has a score of 80 or more is likely to be in the category of games or apps that is responsible for 90% of in-app spend or 80% of download. So, you know, it's, I would say that it's, it's true value is, is, is its predictive capabilities and, um, that's how we're seeing, you know, our customers use it to, to best effect. And um, yeah, excited for, to see how that evolves um, through this year. Me too. It makes for a great pitch deck as well, yeah. obviously. <laughs> obviously. Well, Carl, it's been a pleasure. And um, we will catch up again because the data, it's, it's a massive report. It's another one of those. It's bigger so than it's ever been. Yeah, bigger than it's ever been. I think it's around 97 to like 100, uh, 100 pages this year. And yeah, hats off to our team, um, you know, led by Lexi and Emily that um, continue to, 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 to find different perspectives and, you know, new and engaging ways to, to make this, uh, yeah, better year after year. So yeah, very, very proud of it. And we'll be glad to have you back on the podcast. We had Lexi two parts. There was so much of it. We couldn't let her go. We'll do it again. And thanks again, Carl. Awesome to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Larry, I have to say, great again to see you at Pocket Gamer. Last year, you were on my panel, and I was thinking about everything you've said about esports, investment, and action and where the trends are. So, hey, you're my, you're my trends man in esports. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely great to have you. Been a year. So let's kick it off with a little bit more of what's going on at your company because you invest in esports winning teams, right? So I work at Transcend Fund and Transcend Fund is an early stage VC that invests in the game industry. So we have about two funds and across these two funds, we have about 40 portfolio companies and most of them are game studios. So you might be uh, more familiar with some of the gaming unicorns, such as that game company. We are also the investor of quite a few companies, but some of them are still developing the games. So you may or may have heard of their games. And as an investor, maybe we start there because it's still going strong. Esports is going well. 
I've been talking to some people who say, well, you know, it's lost a little bit of momentum, probably because some people are pulling some of the money out, right? The brand partnerships aren't as easy to come by as they used to be. Some teams straight out. What do you find interesting and exciting as an investor in the middle of a market that's, yeah, it's in, in a state of transition, perhaps? No, that's a really good question. And I should have said that earlier that speaking of esports, I was actually a former professional esports player. And that was way back, right? So that was about actually more than 15 years ago now. And uh, I think I understand that there had been a little bit uh, about market adjustment for the last couple of years for esports. But if we take a long view, a long term view, compared with 10 or 15 years ago, when I was still young, not bold, when I was still a professional esports player, the industry has moved on a lot. And the market is way bigger than 10 or 15 years ago. I think that's probably the bigger picture. I think the second is, I think there have been a lot of the innovations happening in the esports industry. There has been a lot of adjacent opportunities around the esports. And I mean, you know, there has, has been so many figures talking about how big the market is. But let's not forget the esports is not just as a standalone siloed platform. Esports is actually a very, very great way for game companies, for game studios, to engage with their most loyal, most engaged players. And people do not have to be like me, you know, had about 400 APMs and be an esports player. People actually can spend a lot of time watching the content. And that's actually still a very good way to engage with the esports content. Yeah. So I think these are probably like the big picture I would like to mention there. Yeah, I agree. I remember one of the coolest things I saw in esports, I mean, not action wise, right, was that you could do a card game as esports and people were really into it. I think it was Uno, wasn't it? Like one or two years ago? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I think, yeah, that's another, another dimension as well is esports does not have to be super competitive PVP shooting game. It could take it in many, many formats. And for example, Candy Crush, which is a quite casual match three game, they had a, a tournament called a Candy All Stars. And that's actually a esports game in many aspects. You know, it's still very competitive and there's still, you know, just a one winner to, at the end. And people spend a lot of time actually training and preparing for it. And, uh, you know, think about the audience engagement and viewership. It's actually a very, very popular event. And uh, if I remember correctly, I believe they had uh, uh, one of the Kardashian sisters to be the host for that game, right? So got a lot, a lot of the attention, a lot of the um, audience engagement. Yeah. That brings me to the other point, which is, you know, esports is an experience and there's there's money in that for you as an investor. If things are, you know, creating awareness or um, brand amplification and, and, and those deeper, deeper, deeper KPIs that are going to matter later when it comes to team loyalty and game loyalty. So putting your investor hat back on, although it was really cool to know that you were also a player. I'm like, now I have even more respect for you. Been there both sides. What do you find exciting as an investor looking at the space? Yeah, I think you read my mind. I was going to say that because what I said earlier was pretty much from a player perspective. And now if I put my investor hat on, Transcend Fund is pretty much an audience first fund, which means we look at you know how fun the gameplay is, but we also look at its commercial returns and how big the market is. And I think for us, our investment thesis is not just around, let's say, you know, esports or certain pillar. We are really thinking about what are the best ways to create that really fun and engage ways to interact with, you know, three billions and hopefully four billion, five billion gamers globally. We are thinking about what are the best channels. What are the best platforms to engage with these players? And then based on that, we think about, okay, from there onward, what are the best way to think about some of the underlying pillars that could support that really, really big scale? And of course, you know, big commercial returns for, for funds and of course for our LPs. What sticks with me from our last panel last year, and I've heard more about it now because I was just looking at, for example, a liftoff survey of app marketers where they're saying, hey, we're putting much more investment, well, 50% more investment in sort of like influencer, but 30% more spend in community building. So they're onto it. They know it's important. You'll invest in games that have great communities. 
I remember, though, that from our panel, we were saying, you know, really, a lot of games can build communities, maybe not be massive like the esports in a stadium, but um, is there something you have to say to them about look at that over 2024? Think about being an esports game. Yeah. I think uh, when you think about community building and community management, there are definitely two layers. The first one to think about how big that community is, you know, how many players, how many users, etc. But another layer, which is equally important or even more important, is you think about how engaged these community are. Because you don't want to have, you know, lots and lots of the members, but no one really talk about in that channel, right? You want to have ideally a big group of community, but in the meantime, people are really engaged with the content. People are really engaged with each other. And I think that's the best way to think about that. And any of the advice thinking about how to build and how to manage your community should be really based on these two pillars. Yeah. And I always believe that if you have scale, if you have the engagement, and then the monetization of money, it will come naturally. Maybe from you. <laughs> Maybe from you. But what was also interesting and what we were chatting about before, so I grabbed you, said, come up here with me, is looking at that experience because it may be changing. We may be seeing VR coming to esports. That is just mind blowing trying to figure it out. You know, we'll be an audience and they all have the VR headsets on or, you know, they're watching or there's so many different ways to imagine this. What are you seeing? Why do you believe this might be the next thing? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And uh, one thing I should have mentioned or may have mentioned earlier was as a fund, we're investing in a VR studio called a Stress Level Zero. And they make a, a few really, really amazing VR games. For example, Bone Labs and Boneworks. Both of them are top selling VR games on the Steam platform. So I think that means, you know, we already have a lot of the understanding and knowledge for the VR. And the thing we are seeing increasingly more and more from this investment and also from our interactions, our research is VR is moving more from single player dominant or single player heavy content to more and more multiplayer games. So one of the sessions I heard earlier at the beginning today was someone was saying on the top, uh, on the mobile platform for the top 100 games, about 70% of them are multiplayer games. For VR, it's still very single player heavy, but we believe that, you know, that multiplayer is coming and there are a lot of the great, you know, multiplayer games are coming to the VR platform. And esports is a segment of that. You know, you can think about, you know, the PvP, esports, MMORPG, et cetera, et cetera. That multiplayer can take many, many dimensions. The thing we think of the esports on VR could be really interesting are really three aspects. The first aspect is esports for VR is really a great way for esports to expand to another platform, to expand to another channel. You know, we talked earlier about how some of this, let's say, you know, let's say market adjustment for the revenue for the sponsorship. But then now esports is funding new ways to reach the audience, to find a new way to engage. So I think that's great for the overall industry. The second way is to actually think of from the player experience, because that has completely, you know, require a very, very different kind of skill set. When I was an esports player, this was, you know, 10, 15 years ago, my you know, the thing I always brag about was how quickly I can click the mouse and the keyboard combined. This is something called APM, which stands for action per minute. So that's about like, you know, 300, 400, if you want to be a real good esports player. But then think about an esports player in VR, that's totally different dimension, right? It's no longer about, you know, one dimension about mouse and keyboard. It's no longer about that 2D dimension movement in the game. It's actually 3D dimension. There could be so many combos, you know, if you think about a fight, a fighting game, let's say, or a shooting game. So that, you know, that, that'd be very, very different. And uh, my wife always joke about this is if I were an esports player in VR, I would have a six packs already, right? <laughs> yeah, which I'm, I'm, you know, I'm training very hard towards that, right? So that's the second one, which is about, you know, player engagement. And then the third one is also about the player experience because this is also very different in the sense that traditionally when people watch esports, it's always a big stadium that pretty much about flat screen experience. I wouldn't use traditional to describe esports, but let's say, you know, for the non-VR esports, right? 
But if you think about VR esports, that audio experience could take many, many forms. They could watch it also with a VR headset. So they could be, let's say, you know, a virtual character in the game. They can freely move around. They can see different perspectives. Oh, they can understand why that player didn't dodge that bullet or why that player did that move. So that could be one. Or they could still watch that as the traditional way of viewing esports, which is, you know, a large stadium flat screen. That's very interesting. Or they could even, you know, we're talking about VR and AR. Or they could even have, let's say, a location-based esports. What I meant for that is, if you think about, if you have a arena, so probably pretty basic layout. You may have some basic barrier. You may have some basic holes. But then the VR AR can project additional content or additional details into that, you know, that setting. So let's say if it's a hole, you, you may just need to dig a hole in the physical environment. But then in the VR esports, you could all of a sudden that hole could have lots of skeletons or snakes. So that completely changed the, you know, the viewing experience for the players and also for the users as well. So yeah, that's why, you know, I woke up about, you know, I think about 7 a.m. this morning and, uh, you know, have been on meetings for the whole day. And I still feel like really, really energetic because I feel like there are so many possibilities for the whole industry. And of course, you know, there are lots of possibilities for many, many of the developers, for the players, and of course, you know, for the investors like Transcend ourselves. Well, what's exciting about that, why I'm just like mind blown is that it is about the experience. We're all talking about, well, you know, it has to be the experience. You have to have gaming as a destination, right? And live ops and everything has to keep everyone coming back, that ongoing cycle of content. And this is like an entirely different experience that gets us out of a lean back. It's us really involved. And to your point as an investor, now that's going to be audience metrics that really matter. I'm excited about it like you. Um, don't need to uh, to train like you do though. Won't, won't be worrying sorry, about won't, won't, won't be worrying about that here. But when is it? When is it, Larry? When are you to see it coming? You mean uh, for the, the the real the real signs of arrival? Because you're you've invested in companies that are you know making these games, seeing the opportunity. But we've been talking about VR. Oh, you Come on, VR? yeah. yeah. Well, VR that. maybe not mainstream, but VR more melding with these games to bring them out of the screen and, and into the world, right? Yeah, I always see, yeah. I think for VR, if you ask me, I think the the industry had this running joke about, okay, when is the next inflection point? And people always say it's three years later. You know, th I think now if you ask most people, most people will say three years later. I remember asking quite a few people three years ago. Back then, people said it would be three years later. I actually asked people six years ago, people say three years later, right? But I genuinely believe, I think the inflection point is coming up quite soon. And I think that's driven by a number of factors. The first one is the hardware is getting better and better. And I think this is the thing, I, I don't think, you know, I need to explain too much, but anyone has, you know, a Quest, Apple Vision Pro, HTC uh, Vive Elite, they would know, they will all know how much improvement the hardware have been doing for the last few years. The second one is the content is also catching up. Because there had been a bit of the chicken egg thing. Is it going to be, you know, content first and they have, you know, enough attractive content? Then you have, you know, big audience base, but then you really need to have a big audience base in order to have, to have uh, you know, attractive, exclusive or premium content on VR. But I, we have been seeing a lot of the great VR content on various, you know, VR platforms, B Saber, Resident Evil 4. Stress Level Zero, Bone Lab, Bone Works, etc. We've been seeing a lot of that content is coming up. So I think it's definitely getting there. And it was think about, let's say, you know, the player base or the in-store base. And there have been various in industry estimates. And most of them think the VR has that, depending how you count it, are easily over 10 million, 20 million in-store base already. And for any gaming company or any game studios, that's a very, very sizable target to think about. Yeah. So I genuinely think, you know, hardware is getting there, content software is getting there, and also, you know, the general people's perception is getting there as well. I mean, my son, he had a birthday party actually yesterday, and they were playing VR games. And, you know, all the kids, you know, seven, eight years old kid, you know, for them, it's very, very natural. And I think, you know, the 
think about, you know, Transcend being audience first fund, I do think the market acceptance, the audience acceptance is getting higher as well. So hopefully if you ask me, you know, this question in three years time, I will say it's already here. Well, actually, I was going to say, since we've made this into a tradition, we'll see each other probably next year because yeah. it's, a, it's a great show to be at. It's a great way to start the year. Let's say we meet next year. What you what do you want to be telling me? Something you're happy about, proud about, surprised about? You know, maybe you've been uh, <laughs> working out and you yeah. can come and show your muscles. No, I'm just kidding. But really, seriously, what do you want to be sharing a year from now with me? Yeah, it's a very good question. And I think uh, you put me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> The first thing I really want to say is I hope the industry will become bigger. Uh, that's for sure. And we have seen so many unfortunate news recently. And hopefully all our friends in the industry will be able to, you know, recover yeah. and then find the new path. I think that's definitely, you know, my first uh, hope of predictions. Yeah. And then the second is I think gaming as a medium, as, as, a, um, as an entertainment format. I think we'll become even more mainstreams and hopefully we will go and see more and more opportunities that transcend the traditional uh, media opportunities. So meaning going from one platform to another platform, going from one channel to another channel. I think that's what we'll see. The third one is hopefully we're going to see more and more very, very interesting, engaging games coming up. I know I've got, you know, a top 10 list. I'm a, a captain myself, but. Hopefully, you know, all these games will come out uh, next year. Um, and I think that will definitely uh, something as a players, as an industry participants, we're all very looking much, we're all looking forward to. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm looking forward to ca catching up with you again yeah. next year. And uh, you probably got some great ideas here of some companies. Maybe you can share a few who are coming into the portfolio or what you find exciting. I am always ready there and for you. And may I say, it was a yeah. pleasure, was it? So, oh, there we go. <laughs> thank you. All right, nice talking to you, Peggy. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. Absolutely. This show is all about how to do your job better, how to make an amazing game, how to market it. And you have a say. So if you have a story or know someone we need to shine a light on, then we would love to hear from you. We want to hear from you. We want to reflect the reality of the mobile games market in all its wonderful complexity and strangeness. So if you have any suggestions for us, if you have any feedback for us, you can always get in touch. You can email us at podcast at pocketgamer.biz. You can find us on Twitter at PGBiz and you can reach out to us through the PocketGamer.biz website. If you're interested in listening to all of our podcasts, you can find them at PocketGamer.biz forward slash podcast and we would love to hear your thoughts on future shows. And we've got you covered on all the major platforms. So subscribe to the audio podcast, as Brian said. Look for us on YouTube. If you want to read it, hey, you can do that too because we have a companion post for you as well on the pocketgamer.biz website. Tune in again for the next edition of the pocketgamer.biz podcast and we look forward to speaking to you in the near future. Until then, I'm Brian Baglow. I'm Peggy Ann Saltz and that's a wrap until next week. Yeah.